This is Maria from Four Season Foraging, and I'm coming to you today from Minneapolis. And we're having some beautiful fall weather out here. It's more like second summer, actually. It's almost October and it's super warm. But regardless, it is fall, technically. And I wanted to talk to you today about five different fall forageables. Now, some people think of fall as like a time where everything's dying and there's not much that's growing and not much to pick, but that is definitely not true. There is tons of stuff to harvest out there. So today I'm going to talk about five of my favorite fall things to forage. And those specifically are hackberry, aronia berry, rosehip, dock seeds, and burdock root. So since I'm covering five different things, I'm just going to be really quickly going over each thing. But these are all common and fairly easy to identify. So I hope it gives you the start you need to start foraging them. So I'm going to start talking about those in a second here. But first wanted to say thanks for watching. If you like the video, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell for notifications. It's a great way to help me out. And if you're able to, you can join me on Patreon. The link is right down there in the description box. And through that, you can pledge a small monthly dollar amount to help me keep making these free informative videos for you all. Thanks a lot. Behind me here, we have four hackberry trees. And these here are common hackberries, also called northern hackberry. But depending on where you live in the U.S., you might have a different variety that grows around you, dwarf hackberry and sugarberry being the most common. But this tree is a amazing fall forageable. The little berries on there, so they're not technically berries, but we'll just, we'll just roll with it. The berries on there ripen late August or sometimes early September, and they're actually a very dry berry. So unlike things like raspberry or strawberry or blueberry, they can hang on the tree for a long time and don't go bad because they aren't juicy and they don't ferment. So even though they ripen in late summer, or early fall, you can actually harvest them throughout the winter and even into next spring. It can be definitely easier to harvest them when there's no leaves on the trees, like in late fall or during the winter or in very early spring, just because the leaves kind of get in the way of picking the berries off. But really, anytime you can get them is great. <laughs> and they are super delicious, so I do recommend trying them. So to identify hackberry, I like to look at the bark first. It has a very distinctive bark. It's kind of a gray-brown in color and has these quirky ridges on it. It's very unique, very distinctive. The next thing I like to look at is the leaves, which we have a bunch down here on the ground. They are heart-shaped leaves, and one of the hearts, it's like a lopsided heart. One of the lobes is higher than the other, and they are serrated on the edges. And the leaves often have these warty protrusions on them. These are galls. It's created by an insect. And there's so many of them on hackberry, and they're so commonly found that you can actually kind of use it as an identification guide. Of course, it won't have it 100% of the time, but it is really common to find. But there's no other full-grown trees in the eastern or central US or Canada that produce fruits like this. So. If you find something that looks like this with these little dark brown slash purplish fruits on them, it's very likely a hackberry. So I have some of the berries in my hand right here. They grow in these little clusters. It's a little hard to tell that they grow in a cluster because a bunch of them fell off, but trust me, they do. And they're about pea size, maybe a little bit bigger. And this species, when they're ripe, it'll turn like a dark purple slash brownish kind of color. 
And so the reason I said these aren't technically berries, they're actually droops or stone fruits. So more like a cherry or a apricot. Um, they have this hard kernel in the middle. When you eat these, what you actually want to do is crunch through that kernel because there's nut meat inside of there, which is edible and delicious and nutritious. So you just want to pop it in your mouth and crunch through it. You can probably hear that. <laughs> it's very hard. So if you have delicate dental work or sensitive teeth, you might not want to crunch through it. You might want to grind it up instead or do something else to process it. But <laughs> yeah, they're super tasty. I personally think they're fun to eat. They make a great trail nibble, but if you don't want to crunch through them, you can grind them up with a mortar and pestle, or if you have a high speed blender, or you can make hackberry milk, which you can find recipes for all of that online. I am excited to show you this plant right here. It is Aronia, also known as chokeberry, not to be confused with choke cherry. So this is a different plant, but still delicious. So Aronia, I like calling it Aronia because otherwise I start saying choke cherry instead of choke berry and it just starts confusing everybody. But uh Anyway, aronia is a fruit that ripens in late summer and it does tend to stay on the tree for a long time. You can see that there's lots of clusters here around me still. Some of them are dried up, which you don't want those, but the juicy ones are still good to eat. So this is a great fruit to harvest in the fall. And it is a native plant, but you often find it growing in landscapes, in front of businesses, and parks, places like that. And the part you want to eat of these is, of course, the berries. So they grow in these great clusters. Just pick up a little cluster for you here. Hope you can see that. <laughs> and the size varies. Sometimes I find them where they're like tiny, tiny, like smaller than a pea and sometimes they're more like a third of an inch across and personally i like harvesting the bigger ones because it's more time efficient and just from my anecdotal evidence it seems like the bigger ones usually taste better too so let's see what these taste like oh. that's actually not bad they are very astringent that's normal they're all like that when you pick them right off the bush. Some of them are more or less astringent than others. So I do recommend taste testing just to see what the flavor is of the individual bush that you're picking from. Because it definitely, there's a lot of variation. And there's different cultivars, you know, like these are quite large. They're maybe like five or six feet tall but I've also seen ones that are very short, like more like knee height, like three feet tall. So just be aware of that there is differences in size. So since these berries are so astringent, you probably don't want to eat them just right off the bush, unless you like that feeling of having a dry, like cotton ball mouth, which probably you don't. So the best way to prepare them is to make a juice. And for that, you don't even need a juicer or anything. You can just mash it up with some water, squeeze it through a jelly bag or through some fine cotton cloth. You are gonna need to give it a good squeeze to get all the juice out. It does take some, some effort, some muscles, but you will produce a juice with a really unique, delicious flavor and will have sometimes none of that astringency and sometimes just less of it. And there's other things you can do with this besides a juice. You could make a jelly or a sauce. There's a lot of recipes out there actually, so I recommend looking into that. But to identify Aronia, first of all, look for a shrub, which again might be around like six feet, seven feet tall, might be more like three feet tall. And then the leaves are oval shaped and have fine serrations. And the fruit has this little five pointed star at the bottom. 
And that's the same star that you see with like apples and pears. It's a mark that it's probably in the rose family and it will help you distinguish it from some toxic species like buckthorn, for example. And then in the spring, these bushes produce really pretty five petaled white flowers. So I think springtime is a really great time to look for them because the bushes just really stand out in the landscape. But of course, you can look for them in fall too. And these clusters of dark blue, almost black berries are also really obvious in the landscape. So if you haven't tried them yet, I recommend you go look for them. These fruits growing next to me here are rose hips and they are the fruit of the rose plant. So, you know, when you see those pretty red roses or pink or white or whatever color they are, when they go to fruit, they will look more or less like this. This is the rose hip. And you can eat the hips of any species of rose, but sticking to wild species is safer and it's what I do, um, especially when you're thinking about contamination concerns and the things that they spray on cultivated rose species, which they don't think of something that people eat. Um, so, you know, they get sprayed with things that aren't even tested for human consumption. So for me, I like to stick to the wild rose species. And the way I can tell it's a rose is it has alternate leaves. So there's one leaf spaced off at each point on the stem. It's got a prickly stem. Some are more like thin prickles and some are more thorn-like. This one's a little more like prickly, like a raspberry or something. And it has these compound leaves. Depending on the species, there might be bigger or smaller, but it will always be compound. And then the base of the leaves always has these, what's called stipules. They're just like little wing-like appendages that are on either side of the leaf stem. And the way you can tell it's a wild rose and not a cultivated rose is that the wild roses, the flowers are always five petaled. So, you know, with cultivated roses, there's often tons of petals on the flower. They look really like bushy and almost like a globe. So with these ones, they'll just be five petals and then underneath those five petals are five sepals, which you see here on the fruit. These little leaf-like appendages coming off are the remnants of the sepal. So if you were to count these, you would see that there are five. Now there are hybrids between cultivated roses and wild roses, and I wouldn't worry too much about telling the difference there, um, as long as you know that it's growing in a place where, you know, the soil's healthy and it hasn't been sprayed recently, then you're good to go. So what do you do with these rose hips? Well, you pick them in the fall. I personally like waiting until after the frost because it makes the rose hips softer and sweeter. So these are still too early for me. They're still hard and they're gonna, I'm sure have more of a sour taste, but if you're into that, you can definitely pick them sooner. And basically what you do is use them for tea or jelly, or you can make ketchup with them. There's lots of ways you can cook them, but you do want to make sure to process them in some way. The inside of the rose hip has this little like cluster of seeds and those seeds have these itchy hairs all around them. So what you don't want to do is just like pop these in your mouth and eat them whole because those itchy hairs will irritate your throat and also apparently be itchy when they're coming out of you. So definitely want to avoid that. So if the rose hips are big enough, these are a little bit bigger. These are maybe like a half inch across. You can cut them in half and scoop out the seeds and the hairs, and then you can eat them like that or dry them or process them in whatever way you want. Um, rose hips, there are many species of roses. So rose hips come in various sizes. 
Some of them, like in multi-floor rows, are like tiny, tiny, like maybe just a quarter inch across. And then other ones are much bigger than this, like you can find them maybe up to an inch across. Like personally, I prefer to harvest the bigger ones just because it's less fiddly and more time efficient, but you can pick whatever ones you have in the area and just pick a way to process them that's easy for you. The easiest thing to do with them is just to make a tea and be sure to strain that tea through a fine cloth or muslin or something like that before you drink it to catch those irritating hairs. And then you can just drink it plain or you could add some sweetener or you can make a jelly out of that. And rose hips are super healthy for you. They're very high in vitamin C and that vitamin C is very bioavailable, you know, so versus like taking a vitamin C capsule, for example. Getting it from the whole fruit is much better for you because your body can just absorb more of it. So vitamin C really helps like stimulate your immune system and can help fight off like coughs and colds. So it's a great thing to have year round, but especially in the winter or in the flu season months. So yeah, I love rose hips and I recommend that you give them a try. Now this plant growing next to me right here is curly dock. And these here are the seeds of curly dock. And that's what I want to focus on today. There is several edible parts of curly dock, but the seeds are mainly what you want to eat in the fall. As you can see, there's this brown seed head on top of here. And there's like probably hundreds of tiny little seeds on here. And this stalk is actually not super voluminous in terms of what I typically see with curly dock. The seed heads are often like really big and you can just harvest a massive amount at one time. Regardless, these have tiny little three-sided seeds on them and they're related to buckwheat. So you can grind them into a flour and eat them. Now you should know there is like a little papery sheath that's around each seed. You could go through the effort of processing that out. It would be quite tedious. <laughs> uh, I have never done that. I always just grind it up with the papery sheath and I think it turns out fine that way. Um, it's just extra fiber. It won't hurt you. It's fine to eat and it's a lot easier than processing it out. Now to identify curly dock, you want to look at the leaves. The leaves are long and narrow, and they almost always have this wavy edge on them. This is why it's called curly dock. So they don't always have this, but it's often wavy on the edge. And sometimes it'll be even wavier than this. And sometimes it'll be more, more like this one here, which is hardly not wavy at all. But yeah, look for these seed heads in the fall and that's when you harvest them. You can just pick off the entire stalk, the dried stalk. It should be round like this all the way through and it should just snap off when you bend it. And you can just collect a large amount like that just by going from plant to plant and snapping the dried stalks off. And they'll often grow in large clusters. So this one is just here with like a few other plants. It's not a huge cluster, but you'll often see them growing in really large groups together. And then you probably want to hang them upside down for a little while just to kind of get any bugs out. And then you can just rip the seeds right off the stem. It's super easy. Just kind of like that. And you'll end up with a handful of seeds. Just do that into a bowl and then sift them out again to get bugs out and then grind them and it's ready to use. And they are gluten free. So I like mixing it half and half with flour, but you could try working with it on its own and it makes a good cracker is what I've done with it. But you could try other things. You could try maybe doing a pancake because buckwheat pancakes are really tasty. So that might be a tasty thing. But yeah, I encourage you to 
learn more about it and try it out for yourself. Next, I want to talk to you about burdock. And this here is an old burdock stalk. It's also a little tiny one down there. I'm not sure if you can really see it <laughs> with this camera angle, but you got some burdocks growing here. And this is not the stage you want to eat it at, by the way. This is after the plant has gone to flower and produced seeds. And these are the seed heads. And this is probably the part you're most familiar with because these get stuck on your clothes, stuck in your hair, stuck in your dog's fur. And actually the guy who invented Velcro was inspired by burdock. It was a case of natural design. Just a little FYI for you there. The part that you wanna harvest now in fall is the root. So you have to find a burdock plant growing as a basal rosette. So that basically means the leaves coming directly out of the ground in a circular pattern. And these are what the leaves look like. They are very large <laughs> and they get much bigger than this. Like this is kind of medium size for a burdock leaf. Depending on the species of burdock you're looking at, there's a common burdock and a greater burdock and the greater burdock gets really huge. And sometimes you'll find leaves that are like maybe two feet long or even longer. So while this leaf is very large, it's not as big as you can find with burdock. And sometimes people do confuse this with rhubarb. So the way you can tell it apart from rhubarb is that the entire leaf and the leaf stem is fuzzy. So rhubarb is completely smooth. There's no fuzziness whatsoever. Also, lesser burdock has a hollow leaf stem. So if you cut it off or break it off, you'll be able to see it's hollow on the inside. Whereas rhubarb is completely solid. And burdock does tend to have kind of maroon colored, purple colored stems, but those of rhubarb are usually more of a brighter red. So what you want to do to harvest burdock, it is a little difficult. It produces this massive taproot and it does break pretty easily and that's like a defensive thing where part of it will break off and then it'll just keep growing in the soil. So what you want to do is get a shovel and you do want a shovel, don't try it with a trowel and dig down alongside the burdock root. Don't try to pry it out because that's a sure way to break it. <laughs> try to dig in the soil down alongside it and then once you've gotten to the bottom of it which you know, for some burdock plants, it might be like three feet long. If you're getting smaller ones, you know, it might be more like a foot. But regardless, dig alongside it till you reach the tip and then carefully pull it out sideways into the hole you've just created and then lift it up. And it's still tricky. It's definitely a lot easier to do in loose soil. And burdock kind of grows everywhere. So you will often find it in really dense, compacted soil and for me, that's not worth the effort of harvesting the root. So yeah, you do want to try to find it like growing somewhere with more of a loamy kind of soil just to make it easier to harvest. And then the root is edible. You can stir fry it, roast it. There's lots of ways to cook it. You could do like a braising even. So I recommend looking into that. There's lots of good recipes out there. All right, that's the end of my video about five fall forageables. I hope that you liked it and that you want to go out and at least maybe harvest one or two of the five that I listed. Tell me in the comments below which of the five is your favorite, which you're most excited about harvesting. I would love to hear from you. And before I go, just want to say thanks for watching. If you liked it, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell for notifications. It's a great way to help me out for free. But if you happen to have some extra money every month, you can go to my Patreon. The link is right down there in the description box. And through that, you can pledge a small monthly dollar amount to help me keep making these videos for you all. So if you could do that, it would be super great, but no worries if you can't. Either way, happy foraging. Mm -hmm.